Hello, and welcome to another free episode of Statistically Insignificant, a podcast with visual aids. Dangling my feet into the vast ocean of statistics, I will be your nerd guide for the day. My name is Tess, and my pronouns are she and they. Looking nervously on from the shore, it's Bart. Hi, Bart. Hey, how's it going? I go by he and him, and since the last episode, uh, me and the boys went on a boating holiday. So we rented like a Chinese sub and we wanted to see what gear they had at the Australian bases. <laughs> I haven't checked the newspaper or anything, but it, it was a highlight of the trip. Oh, look, anything that strikes fear into the heart of the Liberal Party is good in my book. Hell yeah. Coming down from a distant dune that she is prepared to defend with her life, it's Josie <laughs> Spicer of A Hill to Die On Pod. Hi, Josie. Hi, thank you for having me. I'm Josie, pronouns she and her. And um, yeah, I'm coming down from the hill that I am prepared to die upon. But I'm going to go for a quick dip and search for our late president, oh, prime minister, <laughs> Harold Holt. <laughs> think I might well, find him this time. <laughs> I'm sure he's down there somewhere at the bottom. Today we'll be talking about medical risk using pregnancy and childbirth as an extended case study. This episode has a laundry list of content warnings as a result, primarily medical trauma, discussion of parent and infant death, and pretty graphic body stuff. We may wind up talking about things like mental illness and sexual assault as well. This episode also comes with the this is not medical advice disclaimer. This is barely even statistics entertainment. I am not a doctor. This is merely trying to give a language for talking about the risk. They should issue that statement at the start of a David Cronenberg movie. <laughs> <laughs> I want to talk about pregnancy and childbirth because while it's entirely out of my wheelhouse as somebody who never wants to be a parent, I've encountered an attitude that if intending parents are fully informed about all the things which can happen and how common they can be, they will be scared away from becoming parents, which is not just a gross underestimation of what intending parents are prepared to go through, but means that anybody with an unintended pregnancy is also pretty ill-informed. There's a general exposure gap as well, in the sense that fewer people are exposed to pregnancy and childbirth when young in places like Australia, because families are generally smaller, and we've gotten better at medicine so fewer people have the worst kind of complications and die during childbirth. The grounding principle here really is informed consent. It has to be. And if people fully informed decide that it's too much risk for them, Maybe they shouldn't be facing that risk without the information. The fundamental idea of informed consent is that a person understands their condition, the proposed treatment or interventions if any, and the risks associated with each. This is not fulfilled in many cases where people haven't been fully informed by healthcare pro professionals because talking about the fact that you might have a stroke and die due to really high blood pressure or hemorrhage to death because your uterus fails to contract properly after delivery is a bit uncomfortable. When it comes to pregnancy intervention, there's also a really troubling attitude present in other areas of care as well, that medicine is something done to patients rather than something that is done with them. It's both condescending and destructive, especially when things go wrong. All of these principles apply doubly with unplanned pregnancies, of course. So, Josie, you are actually a parent. Part of why I dragged <laughs> you on was to get your perspective as somebody who has kids and has given birth. So to start us off, how did you find that experience overall? Oh, well, this is the first time that I can say, speaking as a mother, um, <laughs> and not be greeted entirely with eye rolls. Uh, yeah, so I became pregnant when I was uh, 19 years old, uh, or just turned 20, I think. And um, it was unplanned, and I um, continued with the pregnancy for very, um, for, for reasons that aren't rational yep. um and that i ascribe no sort of like moral value to that but um since you know my son is eight years old now and the more i learn about um risks when it comes to pregnancy and childbirth um even now i am so stunned and i do question um you know, if I had that knowledge at the time, um, how would have it impacted my decision making? How would I, you know, 
even if I chose to still go forward with the pregnancy, how would I have looked after myself differently in Mm. that time? Um, You know, so much, so much um, trust is given to healthcare professionals, even when you know that like maybe this you, you, even if you encounter a um, someone with terrible bedside manner you're like well yes. it's okay they're going to still tell me what i need to know and i guess the the thing that sparked this specific episode i'm sure you would have spoke about it eventually but there was a um there was a twitter thread a month or so ago and it was uh by an obstetrician i believe and she was saying how you know up to two thirds of people with, who give birth may experience pelvic organ prolapse mm. in their life. I haven't actually seen that uh, with her. I'm not on Twitter, but I'm not surprised yeah, by yeah. it. Okay, yeah. Uh, I think I think it may have sparked my complaining to you, <laughs> rather, <laughs> um, <laughs> because so um, and this obstetrician was saying like kind of relating it to the patriarchy and being like i think like asserting that you know the i like the patriarchal system that we're in doesn't want people with uteruses to know that because it may impact their decision making where you know they may decide to not carry the pregnancy to term yeah and, you know, that gets in the way of the nuclear family and, and all that sort of thing. And then, so that was that was fine. Um, and it was interesting to see all of these people in the comments, both, you know, child-free by choice, child-free not by choice, people who had children, all agreeing that people should be more informed about the risks yeah, of absolutely. certain... Yeah, except, except this one... Uh, this one obstetrician in the comments was like, was like, no, we shouldn't tell people about that because the risk is only, I think that they said one in like a third of people who give birth have pelvic <laughs> organ prolapse. Oh, only a third um, like, of people. Yeah, only sure. a third. Um, and which, that, which will know, also might... vary wildly by country and socioeconomic. We'll get into that, but yeah. I oh mean, yeah, that I mean that was my first thought too, right? It's like, well, I mean that's still very significant in my opinion. Yeah, but that just... also like, <laughs> you know how the reporting and you know there were all these people in the comments saying, "Hey, I had pelvic organ prolapse and I didn't even know. I just thought that this was my body aging, or I was so ashamed that I didn't do anything about it for years." So like the data would be so incomplete anyway. Yes. Um, and yeah, sorry, just to, just to sort of wrap up, there was this this doctor that was like, you know, only one third of people get pelvic organ prolapse. We shouldn't needlessly only. scare only. people. <laughs> yes. Well, like, you know, that was that was the attitude. Mm. And um, that like said, like proved the original poster's point that people yep. might choose to not continue with the pregnancy if they knew. And it's like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Gee, I wonder why. I mean, <laughs> your organs falling out of your body. <laughs> like, mm, Sounds bad. So for your own experience in that process, particularly with an unplanned pregnancy, were you informed by doctors about like the physiology, about the risks associated with carrying a child to term? Like even on just like a broad population level, some of the possible complications that could happen, some of them that were you may or may not be at higher risk for. Did you have any of those conversations? Those it was sort of like the people I was interacting with. It was sort of like a checklist. Yeah, right. And because I was young, I wasn't actually told. I, I had I had not heard about pelvic organ prolapse once. <laughs> um, I yep. certainly wasn't told. Um, it, it wasn't until after I had given birth and I went back to training in like Taekwondo that my child free by choice instructor was like, Josie, um, we're going to be gentle with like these exercises and maybe yep. focus on this because, and explained how your stomach muscles 
like can separate it's, and yeah, they get trash. Change. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. No one ever told me that, and it was sort of like, okay, you're young, um, so we're not gonna tell you about any of these potential complications. Like, you'll basically be okay. Well, not, not just <laughs> that, but I think there is also an attitude that young people are more likely to get stressed out by the, the idea of having those sorts of complications and might have an abortion as a result, which, mm-hmm. again, if you're not prepared to take the risk, you shouldn't be having the kids. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. No, a- absolutely. The only sort of thing that they did flag in terms of risk was uh, I was almost certainly likely to get um, postpartum depression so mm. they were very proactive with that but f- fluke I didn't um, but I had perinatal depression and I wasn't given adequate care for that <laughs> and I did not realize that that was a thing yep so perinatal depression is specifically like right before the birth period or was it yeah like during pregnancy so yeah okay yeah that was a very hectic time. Yeah. But um, yeah, that, that was the extent of the risk that was presented to me. And the more that I learned just through conversations online, I'm, I'm just like, holy fuck, that is so scary that we're putting anyone through that. Yeah. Um, yeah. What you're telling me is that you didn't really have good experiences talking to medical professionals about this stuff because you didn't have any experiences talking to medical professionals about this stuff. Which Exactly. I, yeah, I think... I hope that is changing now, um, but I, I, it's a small, a faint and foolish hope, perhaps. Yeah. What we're really looking at here is the question of what happens when things go wrong in pregnancy or childbirth. Adverse events and complications is what they're typically called. And the things done to treat those, which are interventions. When we talk about an adverse event, this can be either a particular condition that someone develops, such as morning sickness, gestational diabetes, preeclampsia, which we're going to look at in some detail, and so on, or it can be a a particular outcome, which may be possible from a bunch of different conditions. The most typical of these is the parent or baby dying, for example, which can happen from any number of different causes, And you can deal with the probability of death overall from any cause separate to the particular condition which has it as a possible outcome. So some of the discussion of risk can get tangled up in the distinction there. I'll try to be very clear what I am talking about, whether it's a particular condition or an outcome. Overall, this is kind of sucks to think about. I have heard an anecdote of a birthing class where the midwife running it was going around to ask the... uh, intending parents about perceived worst case scenarios. It was only the last person who actually brought up the possibility of either parent or child dying. A fair few people were quite horrified at the thought, actually. They didn't just didn't want to think about it. I don't know the best way to educate without causing anxiety on this, and many patients may decide that they just don't want to know because it will cause them more stress. I think that is a fair decision to make, particularly if you are inclined to hypochondria, but I think that in those situations, you need to have the choice. You need to know that there is this set of possibilities that you then say, okay, for my own mental health, I'm, I want to have a limited knowledge of that with hopefully support so that somebody can recognize if they are happening. Just to clarify, so like, are you like suggesting that there's like this extra sort of level of consent? where you can sort of mitigate, um, I guess, undue fear or whatever. I think that there could be. I think that Mm -hmm. it will be, it's a conversation that could happen usefully. Yeah. Because like, if you have like somebody carrying a child who is inclined to hypochondria and anxiety about their health, having this swirling mass in their head of all the possible things that can go wrong and all the potentially very minor symptoms that can be associated with those is likely to cause mental health problems, especially if they don't have good support. So in those situations, I think that it would be quite fair for a patient to say, I want to defer this aspect to the care of other people knowing that I am deferring it, which is a very different situation to just never being told. (laughs) Oh, and thankfully, and thankfully, our medical system is designed to produce uh, people with great bedside manner <laughs> who can explain things in like yeah, really simple understandable and great terms, terms and, and empathetic system. Yeah, 
Yeah. <laughs> and there's certainly no there's certainly no class segregation in terms of what care you get. Um, no. Not, no. Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the other half of that is that you re- in that situation, you really would need somebody who is very acutely aware of all the possibilities and all the symptoms, who can just have a regular check-in with this person to see how they're going, to observe like whether or not they are indicating for any things that might be a problem. So that is a, a more intense level of care that, for example, if the person has a partner, that partner might not be equipped to do. So already here you are introducing a higher level of care that this person needs because they they may not be in a situation where that knowledge is readily available. Yeah, that actually like kind of makes me think of, you know, you, you hear about sort of like birth doulas, I think they're called. Yes. Um, I think that's a lot of their, their role is like advocacy and it's like sort of outsourcing that. Um... Yeah, so this was also kind of the traditional role of the midwife. So even outside of actually being there for the delivery, a midwife was somebody who would come and take care of a pregnant person, keep an eye on them, oh. check on their health over time. And so, so I was a home delivery. My brother was intended as a home delivery, but was two weeks late because he's a little bit lazy in that regard. So he, my <laughs> mother wound up being like shipped off to hospital to be induced for him. And in New Zealand, because that's where I was born, let's say approximately 30 years ago at the time, there was a, a home birth movement which was basically um, a mixture of people like my parents who are scientists and who had read the literature and could understand it and interpret the risk and things, who said, okay, given all of this, and because we can access support like midwives and home care nurses and things like that, it would be better for us to have a child at home. And particularly because right. my mother grew up on a farm, she had six siblings, she helped with all that sort of stuff on the farm. So they, they knew what they wow. were doing and they knew what they were getting into. And the midwife in that situation very much played the role of like primary contact with the patient to monitor the progress of the pregnancy. Like I think some, and you also have on top of that your obstetricians and your doctors and things like that, but there was a much more kind of intimate, I guess is the right word, personal relationship between this primary care person and the pregnant person and the pregnant family, which I think is missing in a lot of um, the extremely medicalized pregnancies that happen now. Mm -hmm. Well, it's part of a general trend towards isolation, right? Yeah, but also like the medicalization, by what I, what I mean by that is pregnancy becomes a thing that happens, a pregnancy and childbirth become a thing that happens to somebody in a hospital setting under the control of doctors. And this is, um, proving over time to not be the best welfare outcome for the people involved, shall we say, but is sometimes, and we will talk about one example of this, very convenient for doctors. <laughs> How statistics fits into this is in the form of a way of quantifying risk. So risk is really central to all medical stuff uh, and also other things like workplace health and safety, for example. But how that quantification works isn't necessarily so obvious because how we talk about risk in general parlance is just as this kind of thing where some things are worse than others. Where are two things we care about for a given possible adverse event? How likely it is, or a question of probability, which my handwriting get worse as I cramp it up. And secondly, <laughs> how bad would it be if it did? So we can think about this as a metric of severity. So what we wind up with is actually a two-dimensional system. So I'm going to use uh, a graph to talk about this, and then we're going to talk about the shortcomings with the graph. So if we imagine we have the probability <laughs> on that axis and severity here, and you might have something that is considered more severe, but lower probability, uh, high probability, but very uh, common, sorry, high probability, so as in very common, but quite mild, so low on the severity scale. And you can kind of put different things around this sort of chart. Now the problems. Severity is hard because outside of death as an outcome, it's very difficult to directly compare com potentially very different conditions. Something like severe pain might not be directly comparable to severe nausea. A short-term but debilitating condition may still have less impact on your life than a more mild but lifelong impairment. So it's hard to rank these in a way that this sort of x-axis implies, right? Because I can't just say one thing is here, one thing is here, that means this is 
more severe when probability may also matter. Like, in the extreme case, the ones that I've kind of put here with something that is probable, well, let's say that's probability 1 and that's probability 0, so highly likely to happen, very mild, compared to something that is rare but uh, quite severe, which one of these is quote-unquote worse is debatable. And particularly because measuring severity is hard, in the sense that these symptoms and these conditions are often very multidimensional. So if you have something like morning sickness, that's not just you feel a bit sick of a morning, it can be like the severe nausea, it can be cramping, it can be like exhaustion and discomfort and all this sort of thing, it doesn't just have to be in the morning. I know somebody, for example, for whom morning sickness is currently a midday on sort of thing, mm -hmm. and very bad and very persistent. So having this kind of one axis for severity is a little bit misleading. So the, I guess it's like the severity, it's, it, is that, that's like talking about, yeah, like death possibly being the worst thing, but that's not accounting for like ongoing chronic yeah. sort of impacts and, yeah, and it's other hard, dimensions. It's right? simply health sort of, yeah, whether you're going to die or not, I guess, is like... Yeah, but like that's a binary outcome. And out. even if you survive something that was quite severe, you may have like l literally lifelong problems. Maybe you had a stroke and this is causing like a lifelong impairment to you, which is not death, but it's still debilitating. <laughs> yeah, so how do you rank that on that chart? Like, Yeah, it's hard, right? Uh. <laughs> What's generally done is that you get kind of broad ordered categories. So you might have mild, moderate, I'm going to run out of space again, like severe, and maybe lethal or catastrophic or something like that. But the idea being that even if you can't necessarily get a precise ranking comparing literally everything, you can generally get, I guess, a vibe for some things are worse than others. Right. A lot of this is also potentially quite dependent on a person. Like somebody might have quite a high pain tolerance and be willing to just put up with that, but find nausea just impossible to cope with. So yeah. in many respects, part of the discussion around this, which should happen with medical professionals, is around things like, what of these have you experienced? What do you think you'd be able to handle? If you come up against something that you've not experienced and turns out to be really, really bad, what can we do about it? Is there any like quantifiable measure of pain? Mm, that's really hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So there are like, there are pain scales, but I mean, what, what, because pain is so intimately personal and because it's very, very difficult to kind of recognize when, like, we don't have a way of externally measuring pain, I guess is the way to think about this, which yeah. is one of the big problems in medicine because pain is not taken seriously by an awful lot of medical professionals because it's something they can't measure and something that, like, patients, if they are not able to describe it in a way that is convincing to a medical professional, let's say, they may not get the support that they need. Right. Yeah. So kind of what I'm getting from this is like, there are so many flaws already, but if you're looking at like a macro, like management of patients, sort of like how to, how to like, I guess, triage things. Yeah. I guess this is a relatively useful tool, just like. Yeah. So a lot of this, this sort of thing at like the, top-down public health sort of level tends to look at lethal outcomes, so mortality. Uh, it may also look at near lethal, so things that wind up with a person like being rescued from death by massive blood transfusions because they are bleeding out, but if left untreated that would have killed them, and doesn't necessarily deal well with the long-term stuff. So in general, the medical establishment can be very bad at determining how debilitating things like ongoing pain, nausea, ongoing problems like incontinence, or just utterly trashed abdominal muscles can be. <laughs> like, even particular conditions like morning sickness can range hugely in severity. So the ability to kind of rank those in a quantification system like this is quite limited. And particularly because the medical establishment sorry establishment is not patient centered in the way that it could be you run into problems and the the like public health level approach leaves a lot of people behind because it's very much centered on um 
avoiding most of the time anyway, avoiding those kind of worst case scenarios instead of providing the best possible experience for everyone. Uh, did you come across anything to do with like fistulas in your research at all? So unfortunately, I'm going to have to assign that as a homework problem to the listeners because this is wound up being a very long script. But <laughs> go for your life. Uh, I'm just thinking about this whole like severity thing. Um, so from my understanding, there's like a whole um, hospital. I th- I, you, fuck, I don't remember what country it is. Um, is this the like one somewhere Tanzania? in the African continent? Yes. Yeah. Where um, basically fistulas are... Um, so the fun terminology, well, actually, no, I'm going to interject a, I, for a second here. The fun terminology of what is going to induce some like body horror in some of the people who have made it this far is the term rectovaginal fistula. So, oof. yep. Uh, so what that, yeah, <laughs> what that means is that the wall between the vagina and the rectum or the colon actually gets a hole in it. You can have fistulas in other sense. So you can have fistulas into the like abdominal cavity, but this one is particularly bad because it means you get basically shit moving into the vagina and you get contamination of that quite sensitive microbiome, which has probably had a lot of like tears and perforations into it. So you can get massive lethal infections from this. And it's also like a massive source of shame for people. It can, if it doesn't heal properly, this, these sorts of holes can last the rest of your life. And it can cause like um, bowel incontinence, so you basically can't control when you like shit, more or less, and a whole host of other ongoing problems. And- yeah, I imagine you could get a lot of infections from that as well, right? Oh yeah. Oh god, yeah. So the the hospital that Josie mentioned is I also can't remember which country, but I did read about it a couple of years ago. Um, this is a I, w- I don't know if it's necessarily quite a common one, but it is quite debilitating as a complication of pregnancy and childbirth, particularly in like various African countries where you have very rural populations, you don't have a lot of healthcare infrastructure, and this kind of stuff that requires like specialist surgery to remedy just isn't available to a lot of people. So they built a hospital specifically to care for patients who have given birth and had this problem. And it's just been a, a wild success because it is treatable if you have access it's to very the resources. Treatable. Yeah, yeah. And I think I think that's kind of why I wanted to link it in is like there's also, I guess, this weighing of um, like how quick you can address this issue yeah. as well and how much that would cost the healthcare system as well. Um, yeah, because, yeah, it's like this really horrible thing that can can happen to people, whether it's immediate, you know, outcome of death or it's long term social or you know economic sort of pressure um, suffering yeah and like to have something like that impacts your day-to-day life in a really huge way and it can make it very difficult to care for your new baby or to work if you go back to work after pregnancy so it, it is debilitating in that very very real sense and from memory, they a lot of people who work at the hospital have lived experience uh, with fistulas as well. Yep. So it, there's kind of that added, like, you know, people who may yeah. have, like, um, ha- already had some... They understand guess, what's impacts. going on in a very real, intimate way. Yeah, yeah. And so I, um, as much as I also complain about things um, in Australia not being up, up to snuff... <laughs> Um, there are, it, it, it's frankly criminal that, um, we have to rely on sort of, you know, um, what's it called? Altruism Humanity. of, yeah. you know, richer yeah. people charity, to, to provide this basics. Yeah. 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 Um, charity to, to provide these basic things. To zoom out and Africa as a continent is obviously wildly, wildly different nation by nation or where you are and all that kind of thing. But It is true that it has been subjected to the greatest extraction by the West and is kept impoverished by Western policy. So, yep. um, Oh boy, I have have a future episode lined up for that because I found a paper (laughs) which attempts to um, quantify the amount of extraction that actually happens by rich countries for poor countries. Look forward (laughs) to that in the future when I have the time, maybe. So this is have been a discussion of the severity. Now let's have a look at the probability. It is much easier to deal with probability in numbers. I've already stuck some there, right? 
We know a lot about how probability works, how to understand the uncertainty in how common a condition is, estimation processes and that sort of thing. We're very good at probability. We're not very good at understanding what's actually going on in the severity. So we typically state a condition, that, like the prevalence of a condition as a rate. So this is some number of occurrences in a larger group of patients. So for example, 2.2 cases per 1,000 people. That means over some period of time, usually these statistics are annual uh, in terms of like how they are calculated, but you can think of it as broadly for a, a group of 1,000 people randomly selected in, of a population, you expect to see 2.2 cases in this example. These can be directly converted to a population probability by division. So instead of 2.2 per 1,000, you go 2.2 divided by 1,000 which is equal to 0.0022, or as a percentage, 0.22%. Here we run into something a little bit tricky, because this is a population level probability. How you read that is if you have a thousand pregnant people that you have randomly selected from the whole population of pregnant people, you expect to see 0.22% of them with the condition. This does not mean that if you pull out a particular individual, they have a 0.22% chance of something happening. Unfortunately, probability doesn't work like that, which is one of the reasons that a discussion around this sort of idea of risk and um, stuff using these population level things needs to be mediated by what's going on with the individual. When you compare rates, you need to make sure that the group size is consistent. So you would want to compare your 2.2 your cases per 1,000 to something else which is per 1,000. So let's say we have 10 per 1,000. You would do that comparison where you have the same number here and here. You would not look at 2.2 cases per 1,000 against 1 per 100 because it's not the same group size here. Right. The last note is that you should aim to choose a group size which gives a single digit ahead of the decimal point, so here. So I would not say 0.22 per 100. I would not say um, 22 per 10,000. Because like, unless you are using this, this 10,000 or the 100 for another reason, like say you are comparing it to a bunch of other things that are going on, do you want something that looks more or less like this? So when I talk about like tailoring these statistics to the individual, we know that some groups have higher risk associated with some complications. This can be a matter of your personal physiology. Uh, if you have, for example, had a particularly traumatic birth in the past, you may be more inclined to have problems that would lead to needing a cesarean section. There are also social factors at play. Some social groups have higher rates of adverse events than others, and this applies to particular adverse events as well to like any adverse event. We use the idea of relative risk to talk about this. Risk, in this case, is basically being used as a synonym for probability. So if we come back to our plot here, if we're talking about two adverse events, so the same adverse event is going to have the same position on this severity scale, right? But if we have different probabilities, this group with the higher probability is more at risk because they are more likely to have an event of the same of the same event with the same severity. So that's why this terminology of relative risk is used. Um, so what are the social groups that would have higher or lower risks? Oh boy, we're going to get to that. <laughs> but first, I want to talk about how this is kind of measured. So if one group has a different rate of something occurring than the general population, say the parent giving birth dying, we compare the incidents using a multiplication factor. So it would say something like twice as likely, or double the risk, two times higher. All are ways of expressing the same relationship. That if you take, say, a thousand people in the group in question, and a thousand people in the general population, two people in the group die for every one person in the general population. If we write this with numbers, uh, we can say one in 100,000, whoop, not 10,000, 100,000 as the general population, versus two in 100,000 for the group. This is quite directly a twice as much in this group. And you work this out by taking the group rate, and you make sure you have the same number here, 
and you divide it by the population rate, and that gives you the relative risk. There are statistical questions around how different rates have to be to indicate that the group actually has a different outcome. This is basically a statistical problem of estimation and hypothesis testing. What we do know is that social groups facing structural disadvantage, race, disability, poverty, for example, have worse outcomes in general during pregnancy, childbirth, and the postpartum period. In Australia, the most recent statistics that I've seen on maternal death rates for the general population was 5.5 deaths per 100,000 live births. So in Australia, we have 5.5, and this is all per 100,000. However, with Indigenous Australians, you get 20.2 per 100,000. What? In the, <laughs> I know, right? In the 2012 to 2018 period. That's unacceptable. <laughs> well, would you believe that it's been one of the closing the gap aims for about 30 years now? Oh, cool, cool. Yeah, it has dropped uh, a bunch, but because a lot of these communities, this is particularly a problem in remote Indigenous communities, and they just right. do not have the infrastructure support because the government refuses to give them any money, so they live in pretty desperate poverty in a lot of places and don't have the healthcare infrastructure and can't get access to it because cities are five hours away or whatever. So it's really dire. But let's do that calculation. So we get 20.2 on 5.5, which turns out to be 3.7. 3.7 times higher just total maternal death rate among Indigenous Australians. It gets uh, more shocking if you look international. In 2020, the US maternal mortality rate for the entire population was 23.8 deaths per 100,000 live births. How? Yep. How? Oh, well, actually, yeah, never mind. I just give that one more <laughs> second of thought. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, ProPublica did a lot of um, reporting on this a few years back, just basically saying, well, why does the US have such a, uh, well, it does have quite a low infant mortality rate. So this is infant mortality is from the time of birth to one year. Uh, you also have stillbirths, which is looking at the prenatal period. But the US has a relatively uh, low infant mortality rate, but has this sky-high maternal mortality rate, because the focus, aside from the problems with their healthcare system, the focus has been on the life of the child at the sacrificing the life of the parent. Is it likely that groups of people who uh, have more stigma attached to abortion will have higher death rates in birth? Um... Well, there's so much else going on among those groups. So a lot of people in the US who are anti-abortion activists just go and get abortions anyway. Yeah, it's actually relatively common for them to do that. And there, while there are certain groups within the um, anti-abortion movement over there who are face like the other structural disadvantages, so they are poor, they are people of colour, it's extremely common for wealthy or middle class white people particularly evangelicals, to be hard into that movement. And because they are wealthy white people, they tend to have better outcomes. Right, yeah. yeah. The ProPublica reporting that I mentioned before were particularly interested in structural inequality within the American healthcare system. So while the US general population has uh, 23.8 per, uh, people per 100,000 as maternal mortality, for black people in the US, it is 55.3 uh, deaths oh, per 100,000 live births. Oh, fucking That is so Jesus. many. Jesus. Yep. That's... I have a working thesis that the US is the most evil country in the world. Sorry if this offends oh, anyone. Oh, I, <laughs> I would peg my bet on Britain. Oof. <laughs> well, that's blame for it all. So. <laughs> yeah, 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 right? I mean, there's, there's a low overlap between those two. But certainly... I mean, I, I'm a it... bit of a Saudi Arabia head, but... Uh, <laughs> yeah. I don't think that's... Sorry. <laughs> They're all related, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. But you can hmm. certainly What's see... the common factor? The, the disparity here is actually not as big as the disparity between the Australian general population and the Indigenous oh. population. So uh, because I forgot to do this ahead of time, I'm going to pull up a calculator and do this now. So we get... Uh, I'll put this down here. We get 55.3 divided by 23.8, which is 2.3. Okay. So the relative risk... Huh. Interesting. Yeah, so the relative risk for black people within the United States is less than the relative risk of indigenous people in Australia. 
how I guess it just shows like um, like obviously two point three is still bad. Yeah, like you don't want that to be anything. It's but more it's than like twice how, as dangerous. I mean, I what I haven't put in here is like. We'll talk about it in a bit when we actually look at another example, but you can put like an uncertainty around this and you say, well, the actual value is 2.3, it could be anything from like 1.9 to whatever. We'll talk about that a bit more. So don't look at the numbers written here within the relative risk as this is absolutely the actual true value. There's estimation process right. involved. And just wondering, sorry if this is a silly question, no. but like I, would you... I guess, is it important how you use that number? Because I guess if you say, oh, well, look, this number is less. I mean, I don't know what Sico would do that, but like, it's still not looking at the fact that um, per 100,000 or whatever really it is. It's really bad. Yeah. It's really bad still. Like, so I guess it's like, it's, you have to use that number yeah. pretty so carefully, these, I guess. The, well, these are different arguments. So you, what you have to incorporate this into this is not only a discussion of the relative risk of a particular population in a particular country, but you also look at the actual risk. Right. Okay. Because that is also important information. And like one statistic on its own tends to be pretty useless, especially when it's in a situation as complex and with so many different things going on, so many structural issues and institutional things and just like even personal that you can't use one number to describe the situation. Yeah, <laughs> which, yeah, I feel like that's like an evergreen statement. <laughs> <laughs> I like to think so. But yeah, I do, I do understand. You look at that and you go, oh my God, that's horrific. And it is horrific. But there is also a bigger story here. Yeah, yeah. As a further note on relative risk, the incidence of death from an abortion performed in a safe and sterile environment is extremely low. The same with a, a, like drug-induced abortions using, what is it, RU486 and things like that. Getting information on this in places like Australia and the US is actually kind of difficult because most of the literature is around abortion in unsafe conditions where it is widely illegal, which the America is rapidly becoming, or comes from anti-abortion cranks who are also enthusiastic about hyping up the risk of abortion in fundamentally wrong ways. I did find one paper, Raymond et al. from 2014. So this was looking at abortion-related mortality in the United States between 2000 and 2009. So in many respects, this was a time period when safe uh, clinical abortions were the most readily available because like, it was kind of um, after that period that a lot of the states started really ramping up their efforts to restrict access to abortion. So in the US, between 2000 and 2008, the uh, rate of abortion-related mortality was 0 0.7 per 100,000. So while these are not the same years, if you compare this to the general population mortality above, so the general population was 23.8, which was maternal mortality, you can actually look at a, a relative risk metric here. I would not use this if I was doing research. It's just a guide because these are not the same time periods. But you can do this, right? So you get 23.8 divided by 0 0.7, which is about 34. So you are 34 times more likely to die from carrying a pregnancy to term in the US than you are from having an abortion. And this is something that does not enter the debate around abortion access. It's just healthcare. It literally saves people's lives. <laughs> One last note on the maths. This kind of relative risk is a proportional statement. So we have looked at relative risk as just a direct number here. We have looked at the rates. And you need to compare the rates as well if you're comparing the relative risk. So let's say we have a group that is twice as likely as the general population to see two different complications, but those complications occur at different rates. So we're going to have our group and our general population. We're going to have complications, go away, A and B. So population, the general population for complication A has 1 in 1,000. The general population for complication B has 2 in 100,000. So this would be 100 in 100,000. 
because to get to 100,000, you multiply this by 100. Among the group, well, it's twice as likely. So the group is 2 in 1,000. And, um, sorry, that should be 1 in 100,000. And 2 in 100,000 over here. So this would be 200 in 100,000. If your group has a million people in it, you expect to see a thousand more cases of complication A compared to a million people in the general population, but only 10 more cases of B. Where you spend your health resources should take this into account, and it's part of the unfortunate triage that uh, public health services have to do, particularly when they are absolutely strapped for cash. The other thing to consider is the relative population size. So this is generally a, a shortcoming in allocating like healthcare resources by population size. If your group is very small, then even if it's higher risk, your overall analysis is, well, there's fewer of them, so we'll see fewer cases. And this is one of the things that leads to really quite horrendous structural disadvantage, is that if you have a, a in, in general, like not even just in medicine, but particularly in medicine, is that if you have a small group that is particularly prone to something, but because it's a small group that like the total number of people who have that is small, that's not going to get the funding and the attention it perhaps deserves, precisely because for the healthcare uh, system in general, they look at the whole population and they're saying, oh, if we get an extra five people from this group because they have 20% higher incidence or whatever, that's not factoring into their like risk analysis because it's just a small number of people and this just reinforces bad health outcomes for disadvantaged groups all right let's have a look at a particular example so we're going to talk about preeclampsia which i think i mentioned before this is a condition that is currently thought to be caused by problems with the placenta so the placenta is the um, kind of tissue structure within the womb that acts as an interface between the um, fetus and the uh, like blood system and the nervous system and everything else of the parent. If you have problems particularly with the blood supply or in the placenta, so this is where you get basically um, veins and arteries growing into this tissue connected to the um, parent's uh, circulatory system, then you can have problems with blood supply being restricted to the fetus. And then there is basically a kind of like physiological warfare between, this is the proposed mechanism anyway, between the fetus, which is going, I need more blood supply. I'm going to send out uh, chemical messages to the, the parent's body, which say, hey, give me more blood supply. And the parent's body, which is having like problems generating that blood supply. So the symptoms of preeclampsia include things like really high blood pressure, and you can get protein in urine. So these are like the clinical markers for it happening. If left untreated, it can progress to what is called eclampsia, which involves seizures. It can also cause a problem known as H-E-L-L-P or HELP syndrome. So this is where the patient's red blood cells start to rupture. Their liver develops oh tissue damage. They have a really low blood platelet count. You can get hemorrhaging. You can get strokes. You can develop like liver and kidney damage and it can just straight up kill both the parent and the fetus <laughs> particularly yeah right it's pretty gruesome this is one of the things that the uh, ProPublica um, material focused on because it's one of the leading causes of maternal death it's pretty bad so, so just from my own experience like <laughs> it was sort of like when I was pregnant it was sort of like oh if you're um you know, if your ankles get swollen, put them up. You don't want to have preeclampsia or something like that. And it never occurred to me to actually ask what the fuck eclampsia <laughs> is. Yep. It's pretty bad. I was like, mm, sounds bad. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, this is one of the um, more severe complications of pregnancy. Um, but it's we'll, we'll have a look at the, um, the prevalence in, in New South Wales in a little bit, but it's um, one of the leading causes of uh, maternal mortality in the US, particularly among black people. In terms of severity, preeclampsia is considered very dangerous because it can lead to lethal outcomes, particularly if it's not treated. And if an, even if it doesn't result in death, if you get somebody who winds up with this HELP syndrome, which is, look, I get why it's called that, but it's a bit 
bit cheesy. Uh, <laughs> Help! <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right? <It's> horrible. No, no. <laughs> it can cause a lot of long-term damage. Some of the accounts in that ProPublica reporting were talking about, yeah, I had a stroke because of this, or I had major hemorrhaging and all the rest of it. This is really quite bad. And a lot of the discussion around preeclampsia kind of just doesn't happen. As you said, Josie, nobody talked to you about it. It was just kind of, oh, if you see this happening, you don't want it to happen. Not, here's the actual list of symptoms and here's how bad it can get. That brings me back to sort of, I think, I think that's kind of maybe the weighing up of, okay, let's just like look out for these symptoms that are like theoretically manageable. Mm. Um, and yeah, like no one didn't like no one scared me, but I don't know, maybe I would have maybe I would have chilled out more if uh, I knew what the the risks were. I don't know. Well, uh, this is this is why yeah. it's such a hard conversation to have and why I am hoping that maybe for one person this episode gives them a language to talk about it. Because yeah, yeah. I mean that's that's one of the problems when you have a very limited general population statistical literacy is that it's hard to talk about these sorts of numbers because patients like may or may not have the background. Doctors are very bad at it because they don't necessarily have the <laughs> statistical background. And what's lost in the middle is all of the ideas of informed consent and just telling somebody here is the possibilities, here how like is how likely it is at the population level. These are your additional risk factors that make this particular thing more likely or whatever. You can do that if you have the time and the language and the knowledge to do so. Because I also think there's a um, an in informed consent thing running the other way when it comes to Western aid in Africa. Mm. I've heard tell of uh, aid that will only be given if uh, women prove that they're on um, birth control, uh, contraceptives and that kind of thing. Yeah, uh, <laughs> there's some pretty grim shit going around um, regards to, shall we call it a population control? And there's this interesting conflict over there between uh, some groups which are very much on the women need to have fewer babies sort of train and other groups of it which are very much on the, like the religious groups, particularly out of the US, contraception is evil, babies are a gift from God and all the babies should be born. So aid from those groups, and this has been uh, foreign policy by the US for a while, is not provided if there is abortion at the same clinic or contraceptive education necessarily as well. So that is I a memory whole of that one. Thing. Yeah, it's pretty bad. I <laughs> Maybe people should be able to make their own decisions. Yeah, yeah that's, like too much. Thing. that's too much. <laughs> <laughs> that's communist thinking somehow. <laughs> Shit. Oh dear, not on this podcast. Okay, so let's go through the occurrence data that I found in New South Wales. So this was a publication from 2003. It is looking at the time period of 2000 to 2008. This is not the most recent data, but this snippet of an abstract is a really good teaching tool for the statistics. The numbers here are an effort to describe what happened over the time period in question, so for preeclampsia in New South Wales, but also to use that data to estimate the possible future behaviour for a different population of pregnancies. So what this is doing is, like most estimation process in, in, processes in statistics, particularly in public health, you have a, a history, a, sorry, you have a data set which is the history of how many of these things happened, where did they happen, what were the like, demographic features of the people that ha it happened to. And with that, you can say, okay, looking forward, we expect or we know that the population of people who are becoming pregnant now looks more or less similar to that. So we are going to estimate the prevalence of this into the future using that historical data. So first off, the overall incidence of preeclampsia was 3.3%. So this means for among every single birth that was recorded in this time period, so over those eight years, uh, for people in New South Wales, 3.3% had preeclampsia. So that means if we convert that to a rate, 3.3 per 100, because that's what a percent is. With a decrease from 4.6%, so this would have been 2000 data, to 2.3%, so it's 2008. The incidence decreased over that eight years of preeclampsia. 
The overall rate of eclampsia, so this is when preeclampsia progresses to have those seizures, was 8.6 per 10,000 births, or 2.2% of preeclampsia cases. So the 8.6 per 10,000, let's convert that to uh, this, look at these per 100, or we can go the other way. So you'd have to divide that by 100 to get back to 100, so it becomes 0. Uh, 086 per 100. Right, this is for eclampsia. So how you get the 2.6% um, is you divide 0. 0.086 by 3.3, because that is the proportion of the people who had preeclampsia that developed into eclampsia. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. So because they that, that necessitates them having preeclampsia, I guess. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the kind of important connection there. I was just going to ask: Is that number likely to have gone up since two thousand eight, just because uh, standards of living has gone down, or is it more in the medical technology itself that? Uh, I don't know. Sink. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Sorry. It, this is not <laughs> my field, unfortunately. I just talk about it. Uh, with an increase from 2.3, so this was the 2000 level, to 4.2. So what that means is that while the overall rate of preeclampsia has halved, dropped from 4.6 to 2.3, within that, the incidence of eclampsia developing has nearly doubled. Oh, what? Yeah, How? well, yeah, so this is an interesting question. Why does that happen? All right, so that's that's a medical question that you then have to go and look at all the like all the data that you've collected from these cases. But I mean, just pulling out of my ass, if you will, a possible reason is that the people who are no longer developing preeclampsia are the ones who were at lower risk of developing eclampsia. Okay, yeah, yeah. So that could lead to this. There may there's probably other stuff going on that I do not know about. Not a doctor, but that's the sort of thing where I would go, okay, this is a possible explanation. Mm -hmm. Right, because it's is it sort of like um, they're having the risks of preeclampsia mitigated through whatever care they're getting? Potentially, yeah, well, that like... that's certainly a possibility. Yeah, right. Yep. Okay. The relative risk of eclampsia in preeclampsic women in 2008 was 1.9. Okay, so how you get this number is you get your, uh, where was it, 4.2% which was the 2008 data, and you divide that by the 2000 data, 2.3, which gives you your 1.9. So this is the relative risk in 2008 compared to 2000 of somebody with preeclampsia developing into eclampsia. It's nearly twice as likely, is basically how you read that. Now the next thing I really want to talk about, a 95% confidence interval. We're going to do a whole episode on confidence intervals at some point. They oh, are, yeah, because it's they are widely misunderstood, but they are kind of a statistical tool and a method of estimation. Basically, what you are doing here is you are saying, we know that measurement error happens. We know that samples are not entirely representative of populations. So using that knowledge of like the sampling process and of the structure of the population, we can give an, a, an interval, a range of plausible values for the quote unquote true population parameter. So in this case, they are saying uh, 1.28 to 2.92. So what that means is that among the population, among the existing population in 2008, help me, if we saw a fresh crop of people, shall we say, <laughs> rather grossly, becoming pregnant, then among them, the actual relative risk of, of eclampsia developing from preeclampsia could be anywhere between 1.28 to 2.92 times higher than it was in 2000. The way I think about it, and, and this is particularly hard because it's a confidence interval for the relative risk, not the confidence interval for the actual incidence, right? So it's talking about this number as a comparison between the two years. The other way to look at this is we actually use confidence interval to do confidence intervals to do hypothesis testing. So in this case, if your relative risk is one, then it means nothing has changed. The way to think about that, right, is if this fraction has the same number on the top and the bottom, you will get one. 
So if you have, if your relative risk is one, then you have the same risk for both of the groups. In this confidence interval, how you do the hypothesis test with some, like, go back and watch our episode on hypothesis testing to talk about that structure. You look at this interval and you say, does this include one? If this does not include one, then you have evidence that something has changed. Because that is outside, that one is outside the bounds of a reasonable number based on what you have observed. Okay, cool. Yeah. They are very difficult to teach because there's a whole lot of probability theory behind them that is generally not talked about when people introduce uh, confidence intervals. It's hard. That's like a, that, that last way that you explained it then very well suited to my brain oh good <laughs> <So>. <laughs> yeah. but yeah we will definitely do a, an episode on them at some point because they are hard and using them to test hypotheses is very unintuitive a lot of the time <laughs> does it have one yes no like yeah like, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah but this this by the way is that's only useful in a situation when you're looking at a ratio like this <laughs> right okay <laughs> Because if you're looking at a difference, right, if you're looking at 4.2 minus 2.3 and you're asking, is there a difference here? You'd look at zero, not one. Because when this is zero, <laughs> yeah, then okay. that means there's no difference between them. Yeah. This is one of the complexities. Yeah. But in this case, with relative gotcha. risk, we look for one. Can this use, be used to calculate Twitter ratios? <laughs> Twitter ratios. <laughs> this, this could tell you if the different. Well, what, what you could do with this is you could say, okay, do I have enough evidence that somebody has been ratioed? <laughs> <laughs> I love this. You could definitely do that. <laughs> A risk of um, Eve Butler being ratioed <laughs> in the year of our law, 2022. Sky high. As, as <laughs> no one deserves. needs to do this math, but um, <laughs> I appreciate it. Okay. We also have... Uh, relative risk of death. So this is your mortality statistic. The relative risk of a woman with preeclampsia or eclampsia dying in the first 12 months following birth compared to non-normotensive, this means people who don't have that condition, women, is 5.1. So we haven't been given the raw numbers here uh, as a rate for either one. We have just been given the relative risk. How you read this is that if you develop preeclampsia and or eclamp well into eclampsia you are five times more likely to die than people who do not which is you know, quite a bit higher this is why it's one yeah. of the uh, leading causes of death among pregnant people we also have another confidence interval here which says that based on the data we have observed this actual relative risk could plausibly be between three and eight and a half estimation uh which is basically what this process is, can be very, very difficult for rare events. Um, this is not so much the case with eclampsia. I mean, 3.3% when you have something like, I think this data was looking at 700,000 deaths, uh, sorry, not deaths, births, whoops, in that time period. That's not a particularly rare event. But you do get some um, complications which are quite rare and it can be quite difficult to get data on them. This is generally true for diseases or, or, or anything else, but particularly in medicine for rare diseases, data is hard. And <laughs> God help you if you wind up getting a disease named after you, because that's real bad. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> so what this tends poor, poor to mean... Poor old Lou Gehrig. <laughs> what this tends to mean is that extremely rare complications have more uncertainty around estimated prevalence. So I was going to put another example in here. Uh, but this rapidly became a very long episode when I was writing it. So, dear listener, you will have to investigate the numbers related to the uh, internal organ prolapse that we were talking about, and also rectovaginal fistulas in your own time. This is your homework. We also <laughs> don't yeah. really have time to talk about the relationship between complications, because some of them are more likely to co-occur. What that means is um, there are some complications where if you have something happen, something else is more likely to happen and vice versa. Instead, I want to talk about pregnancy interventions. This is where the idea of informed consent about risk really comes to the fore, because it's where patients have to make decisions about what care they get based on their own risk analysis. If there is a problem with a pregnancy, an intervention may be done to try and change the outcome. But interventions themselves come with risks of complications, depending on what the intervention is, and patients need to understand those in order to make an informed choice. Josie, 
did you have any discussions around needing interventions during your pregnancy? And was it made clear to you that you had choice, like that you could refuse interventions and that sort of thing? Uh, no, I, I don't think so. Okay. Um, so given that it was the public system, they tried their best. I, I, f- I felt like the individual nurses and midwives they tried their best Mm. to make me feel like I had maybe more um control over the process than I did but I was still just so out of my depth yeah like yeah but you so I guess the the other half of that question is did you have interventions during your pregnancy or childbirth um what does so like so uh this could be um, anything from like going and having like a uterine massage in order to change the position of the baby up to when including cesarean section you can take drugs oh, side. Uh, yeah uh so yeah so i was induced um right. so that is because, an intervention yep yeah yeah so i was induced um because my perinatal depression i felt like if this baby didn't come out of me i was already two weeks overdue yeah i was like if this baby doesn't come out of me i feel like i might take my life and i don't yeah. want to yep um yeah, so that was one of them. And then also while giving birth, um, they had to uh, cut my vagina open. Otherwise, my um, son would have died. Um, oh, Jesus. That's rough. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so, okay. So you And had... that was considered low risk. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. So for that first intervention, so with the um, induction, that sounds like it's something that was chosen in order to like uh deal with like mental health complications in particular um were you i it sounds like you didn't have any kind of discussion around like the possible i guess complications of an induction um not really yeah. i i realize no, that you really, given no. that you were like potentially suicidal i realize that you may not have been in the place to have those informed consent discussions at the time Yes, yes. And I think that that is like the side of it where maybe the calculation on like the midwife's end was probably like, yeah, she, this, this, the potential risk. Yeah, well, this is like one of those cases. Is much higher. Yeah. This is one of those cases where informed consent as a preparatory measure is really important. If you had had discussions around that before it got so bad that they had to make this intervention, you could have had a plan in place. You could have said... Exactly. Yeah, and, and like, this is also where if you have a partner involved, having them... Because a lot of the time partners wind up being asked to make decisions about the care of the person who is pregnant and giving birth, up to and including, do we save the person, the parent, or the child <laughs> in worst-case <laughs> scenarios, right? So... um that kind of broader discussion of everybody who is invo- involved in the care and everybody who may find themselves in a position to make hard decisions needs to be done ahead of time, needs to be done with as much information as the patient is willing to hear, or at least if they choose not to have that information, other people around them need to be able to provide that support. And like one of the big things around birth trauma is a, a feeling like you had no control or a feeling like things were done to you that you were not okay with. Mm-hmm. Turns out informed consent really helps with that. <laughs> Shockingly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask with um, the mental health uh, stuff around pregnancy, um, are there studies on it in terms of a broader pattern of mental health going into the pregnancy or, and how much is caused by the pregnancy or the birth? Okay, so, yeah, so I haven't read a huge amount into this, but I do know that people with pre-existing mental health concerns generally are more inclined to health mental health problems directly around uh, childbirth and particularly like postnatal depression and things like that. Uh, it's not universal. Uh, there's basically a higher risk. This do- also does not mean that people who don't have existing mental health are all going to be fine, right? Because there are quite severe cases where somebody whose mental health has been fine comes to the postpartum period and winds up with psychotic depression or something really like debilitating like that. So pardon me, there is research looking into this as a broader kind of public health issue around mental health, certainly. It's just it's not well dealt with because like nothing around mental health is really well dealt with at the moment. <laughs> yeah, of course. 
How we think about risk regarding interventions is to look at basically the whole list of side effects and problems associated with the intervention and compare that to what the intervention is trying to solve. This isn't, as we said, this is difficult to do numerically because it's too complex to assign numbers at that point. Instead, the effort is to kind of construct a direct comparison. Does the patient consider not doing the intervention risky enough that doing the intervention is the better idea? And this can range to relatively simple decisions like having that kind of uterine massage to try and change a baby's um, position so they don't have a breech birth, for example, up to and including like having a cesarean section or having an induced birth in order to like account for other problems. Ideally, the risk of the intervention is lower in totality than the risk of not doing it, and leaving the condition it is intended to treat to run its course could be lethal, right? Unfortunately, this informed consent doesn't always happen. I reached out to people for things that they thought should be in this episode, and one got back to me with the following horror story. The person in question and his wife had done quite a lot of research in planning becoming pregnant and having children. In Australia, they had gotten the private healthcare cover, which is a whole other discussion. But basically, um, in Australia, you can elect to have private healthcare cover, which pays for care in private hospitals, which is a nominally, like, it's, it's a big for-profit thing, and now system winds up being basically half-privatized as a result. They are thought to, in general, provide better care, whatever. The, um, they had done this research, they had gotten the private healthcare cover, and they thought, found the best obgen, obstetrician gynecologist available. This doctor told them that they would need a cesarean because the baby was too large for vaginal birth, would have too many complications if the vaginal birth went ahead. So they duly booked in to get the operation. She went under the knife, oh, no. and the baby turned out to be smack bang on the median size. In the following days, the mother developed a catastrophic infection at the surgery site that very nearly killed her, which was just a shade traumatic for everybody involved. That was the point where they found out that the obstetrician gynecologist was off on a holiday. He had, in fact, put all of his patients in for C-sections so he wouldn't have to interrupt oh. his plans. <laughs> At least one of which was, it seems, medically unnecessary and nearly killed the patient. Let's call this alleged medical malpractice. Oh my god. Like, how fucked do you have to be to nearly kill your patients with unnecessary major surgery? Like, he could have, I don't know, taken the time to set them up with other doctors should they have given birth that weekend. Well, he it wanted the money. <laughs> Probably. I don't know. Oh. Like, what, what, what? It's just selfish. I, it, I can't it's... even rationalize it. Yeah, it's just horrific. Like, the hard-learned lesson from them in many respects, and, like, my family has learned this with cancer care rather than pregnancy and childbirth is that second opinions are really, really important and really, really oh worthwhile. My God. So uh, let that be one of the lessons to the audience. I suppose if you can, if your doctor is proposing a major intervention or you think they are really dismissive of your concerns, go and see another one. Sorry. I, I was, this doesn't necessarily do to, isn't due to pregnancy, but one time I was getting my skin checked by a doctor who used to be an anesthetist and I he asked what my allergies were and I said atropine sulfate and he's like that's not possible no one can be allergic to atropine sulfate <laughs> oh really and I was like oh okay and then I went home and I was like okay I, I should trust a doctor even if it is a doctor who answered a question I did not ask and I googled it and it, it, you can be what the fuck like, yeah, I mean, <laughs> there, and, and, and there like, are a lot of gaps of knowledge among doctors and I mean statistics is genuinely a large one <laughs> yeah but that's just like I, I know that's not really like a, a risk thing but I guess it kind of is because no, it's it like, is because imagine just if, telling me <laughs> well, no no but imagine like, if you went ahead and you wound up with like anaphylactic shock or something like that or like I don't know where that gets used in, in medicine, but if you don't tell people that you are allergic because you think it's not possible, that could kill you. Oh. Ooh, yeah. I know where it is used. Um, one time I had to get my an IUD taken out ah. into the uterine device, and the nurse was about to use atropine sulfate on me, and I was like, did you not check my file? Yeah. <laughs> I'm allergic to atropine sulfate. So. Yep, there you go, right? 
accessing like a second opinion can be quite difficult. So the person in that story lives in Tasmania and Tasmania has a very understaffed healthcare system because it's quite a small population. It's fairly remote. There's a lot of doctors who are fly in, fly out from Melbourne and other places on the mainland. So you may not have easy access to second opinions. Unfortunately, it's really shit. One of the things that I think COVID has done in this area is that a lot more doctors are open to remote like appointments. So you can do teleconferencing or whatever else, telehealth stuff. And that I think is going to really help a lot of people in remote areas. It's not as good as having them able to poke and prod you necessarily, but it's something. Yeah, because even just saying, hey, this what? other doctor suggested we're booked in for a C-section. Yeah. What's, What's your opinion? Here? Yeah, yeah, and, and one of the but, oh, one of the God, things that I, really sorry, comes it's rotten. <laughs> yeah, it's really fucked up. <laughs> and like they were so traumatized by this that uh, quite understandably, and trying to deal with this new baby, that they didn't actually have the energy to put in a formal complaint because that is something that you, as the patient, have to manage as well. One of the things that really came to the fore in the ProPublica um, publications, and I am going to link to this in the show notes was just how many people found themselves dismissed by medical staff. And this is broadly true in medicine, and particularly with things like people from disadvantaged groups, people dealing with chronic pain or whatever, Getting being your own advocate or being an advocate for your partner who is a pregnant person is a shitload of work. And you need to have enough of the right kind of language to be taken seriously by medical staff. Because... They don't necessarily believe people when they tell them, hey, I feel like shit in these particular ways or, you know, talk about risk and things like that, which is just a systemic failing of the healthcare system. It also seems awesome that we have a justice system that's designed to round up every poor person in a given area, <laughs> but does not seem to apply to cases where someone is put at risk by the fact of their... Uh... Well... <laughs> so so if there are cases where medical malpractice becomes criminal where people die as a result and becomes cases of manslaughter like in australia we've had some quite famous ones of these over the years but there certainly are i mean the justice system in general is underfunded and under supported whatever its aims are but in this specifically it's just not really like a focus i guess like if if the kind of barrier to entry to that is before you get to the level of the justice system. It's the level of the healthcare system, I suppose. So medically unnecessary cesareans have kind of been a bit in the news in the past few years, or at least I've seen stories of them. Uh, whether or not that reflects like weirdness of my newsfeed, who knows? What this means is a cesarean where there is not a noted physiological risk factor which would prompt one given like risk analysis. So if your infant is too large, if there are problems with the placenta or whatever else, there can be medical reasons to give a um, a cesarean. There are also like personal ones, so which is what typically comes in under quote unquote medically unnecessary. Cesareans are often presumed to be an easier option than vaginal birth, so some parents will request them. Uh, in other cases, they are recommended for doctors by doctors for other reasons. Hopefully, not very often because the doctor is going on the holiday. So there was a 2019 review article, Janabi et al, in the show notes below, which looked at reasons for patients requesting cesareans. They found that a lot of anxiety around vaginal birth, about the pain and the potential for physical and psychological trauma, was a major factor. There was also concerns for the infant going through the process. And one of the things that really did leap out at me just as it did in ProPublica articles, was concern about lack of support from medical staff during the labour process. Again and again this comes up because patient-centred care is not always the practice standard. There were like real horror stories all over the place about dismissive staff or staff who were like bullies, I guess, and particularly like in the, the period of time immediately post-birth, one of the things that um, Tasmanian couple had happened was that uh, the, the nursing staff were really quite shitty to them because the mother couldn't breastfeed. For one thing, she nearly died, and for two, some of the medications they were on had big warnings on the bottle to say, this is potentially carcinogenic to infants, do not breastfeed while you are on this. That, of course, didn't, that didn't stop the bullying, but 
you know, it fucking should have. <laughs> I had no pain relief during oh, most Jesus of my Christ. labor because um, they told me, oh, well, the typical induction takes like can take up to two days like before oh, you give birth. Fuck that. And that that night um, I woke up and I was in excruciating pain and I kept calling out and they were like, no, you're not. You've just got to like a stomach ache or something. Oh, God. Like, oh my God. <laughs> and, and eventually one nurse said, take her down to the birthing suite. She's waking up the other mothers. I was eight centimeters dilated. Jesus Christ. Oof. Eight out of 10 guys. <laughs> 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 so, um, yeah, no dismissive. Um, yeah. yeah I it's mean, like, oh, well, it usually takes two days and they're using that bit of I, like, yeah, this, so guess... this is where your population level estimate statistic, average duration two days, fails at the individual level. And, and no, this is quite a serious problem because a lot of the time when nurses or medical staff or whoever else gets taught whatever statistics they get, they get presented averages as a, like, a number that defines universal experience instead of something that is kind of an estimated average that you have potentially a huge amount of variation around. And like, that's a real shortcoming in general statistics education. And it's one of the things I talk about constantly totally, is how much yeah. that variation matters. I mean, even if you just have two statistics, one of which is the average and another of which is a metric of the spread, much more informative. <laughs> going back to the cesareans for a section, for a section, going back to cesareans for a second, one of the reasons well, the primary reasons that they are considered risky is it's major surgery. In the worst case, has a higher mortality rate than vaginal birth as well. To get into the uterus, you're going through a lot of tissue layers. And aside from complications like the infection that we mentioned before, other things or other things that can go wrong, wrong on the operating table, like blood loss or hemorrhaging, the surgery recovery is hard. It's even harder when you're trying to juggle breastfeeding, if you can breastfeed, and a nude baby with your abdominal muscles cut through. And long-term complications can be pretty debilitating, including that those abdominal muscles never properly heal. So that just makes things as simple as moving, lifting, coughing, sneezing, chewing, trying to sit up in bed, potentially impossible. One thing I have heard of, if this is particularly a case in Australia, is that if you have like this long-term damage to your abdominal muscles, one of the things that can fi fix it is a tummy tuck, right? Which is generally considered elective plastic surgery, cosmetic surgery specifically. So for a lot of people who have gone through that process and who need this in order to function properly because their abdominal muscles are trashed, they get basically no support from the medical system because it's thought that they are doing this for aesthetic reasons and not, you know, ability. Oh, but And that is true across a lot of areas in plastic surgery, which is often yeah. necessary in terms of like breast reductions, in terms of uh, trans healthcare. Like yep. it's, uh... mm -hmm. Yeah, so one of the problems in the Australian healthcare system is that um, breast reduction as a procedure is treated differently by our healthcare system, uh, Administrative Medicare, based on like what it's doing and there's just like the, the internal codes in that system which identify like a breast reduction are all screwed up so whether the state pays for it or not it's just entirely like up in the air but when you try to get it done and this is particularly fraught for trans people trying to get chest like top surgery so in comparison to cesarean vaginal birth is not easy let me be very clear i mean josie has described her own experience with that it can be extremely physically and emotionally traumatic pain management is already a whole other topic that we have gotten into a little but it's a huge thing and taking patients seriously is a big structural issue there this is why having an open and supportive discussion of risk is so important if somebody fully informed of the risk of a cesarean and cognizant of what it involves still feels so anxious and stressed by the idea of vaginal birth, then it may well be better for their well-being to have one, even if it is major surgery, even if it has these potential long-term complications. That is a much higher standard of informed consent and information than patients tend to get. I highly the very recommend uh, looking into the history of uh, cesarean birth, by the way. It's a fascinating one. Fascinating and potential and horrific. Yeah. Yes. 
Um, I guess the last thing I want to bring up is um, talking about tubal ligation and yes. how um, hesitant um, or how hard it is to get mm-hmm. tubal ligation um, in Australia if you have a uterus uh, because you're presented with this thing that it's like a high risk, you know, major surgery or whatever. Isn't and like I'm sure that they're like laparoscopic surgery. I'm pretty I'm pretty sure it's not that invasive um well certainly not compared to a cesarean for example well this is this is the thing right is like okay well first of all this is what you know this is what i want yeah (laughs) which i think speaks for a lot Mm -hmm. um compared to the potential like risks of all the things that come with um you know yeah having pregnancy and childbirth another child pregnancy and childbirth and just also not having, you know, control over your body, I, yeah. I think is the ultimate thing. Like that that in itself is very distressing. Being told that you might want to change your mind one day. Um, <laughs> well, hysterectomy yeah. is another really, really big one. Um, so this is huge, not only for trans men or non-binary people who want to have their like uterus and ovary removed, but also like for people with debilitating like health conditions related to that tissue being in their body. So what is it? Um, There's a bunch of different ones, like polycystic ovarian syndrome, for example. Another one is, I should remember. Endometriosis. Endometriosis. Yes, that's the one. So this is where the uterine tissue, so the tissue of the uterus, particularly that tissue related to menstruation, grows outside of the uterus. It's one of the primary things that happens in that. And that can cause tumors, it can cause crippling pain and like horrendous other health complications. And like infertility is also a really big one around that. But God help you if you just say, look, I just want it out of me. Because (laughs) you're not likely to be able to get that, even though it will be the solution. Oh, I went to Catholic school and the rules (laughs) that they have around fucking what you can do with the with surgeries to do with wombs and uh and the like yeah is oh fucked up I on it like <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> all right well i think that is an episode josie thank you so much for coming on where can people find you oh okay thank you for having me um bart and tess you can find me on twitter at JSSPCR1, or you can listen to A Hill to Die on Pod. And I've just started up a new podcast with my co host Lucas, which is called Australian Gothic. Um, yeah, find me wherever you find your podcast. Australian Gothic Thanks. has been very interesting for me to listen to because I'm imported. Like, I'm originally from New Zealand, but I've lived here most of my life. And I have just not been exposed to this kind of Australian culture. <laughs> so it's like from an outsider perspective, it's really quite fascinating to have grown up so much in this sort of environment, but not been exposed to these particular things. I haven't listened yeah. to that one, but I really love A Hill to Die on. I think it's a very good podcast. Yeah, it's well, possibly, thank well, you. it is possibly the most intellectually honest podcast I've ever encountered. So <laughs> I love Aww, it. Thank you. That, make, that makes me feel good. And, um, I recorded an episode with you, Tess, months ago, yeah, but I decided that, that I, <laughs> I, yeah, I have a whole bunch of questions um, for that. So um, we'll get I'll to let it sometime. Know. Yeah, yeah, it's about yeah. Um, marrying STEM with the arts and humanities because and I also wish, I guess, my rage against entire STEM fucking... bros. <laughs> yes. But um, and you've also just like made basically an entire podcast out of it anyway. Yeah, because pretty you much. Had a lot of oh, yeah. nuance. <laughs> So, for the yeah. for you dear listener if you found this useful or interesting and maybe worth some money wink check out our patreon patreon.com slash statistically insignificant we even have bonus episodes roughly once a month but thank you as well for coming on thank you very much uh, i just wanted to say uh, if you happen to have stumbled on this podcast through a youtube hole or something like that my twitter is at snitch and orwell no g um follow me <laughs> It's a good time. It's mostly like movie reviews and communist jokes. As one does. All right. I'll see you two later. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye. Bye.